it's Ryan Follin from the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, and we just had another amazing social media lunch. Sponsored by the Office of Inclusive Excellence, we talked about storytelling and how important it is to tell stories through social media. We also talked about the hero's journey, and we talked with a student, a graduate, and a faculty, and tracked their journey on campus through the hero's journey. Then as a group, we got together when we figured out where everybody plays a part in that journey. Uh, my name's LaDonna Menis and I'm a new staff member at UCI and I think this social media luncheon was a great way to meet new colleagues and other people who work in other departments but it also helped me to kind of understand and visualize where our department fits within the hero's journey and within the overarching story of UCI. Hi, my name is Jenny West. I work with the graduate division on campus here. I work with their social media strategy and social media platforms. We today talked about storytelling at this lunch and that's very important for my department because we tell stories to students that we're trying to recruit to apply for graduate programs. We tell stories to our current graduate students to help them find success on campus and we tell stories to graduate alum to keep them involved with the campus and with their programs. Um, this is my fourth lunch that I've attended, social media lunch, and every month provides value to me and I hope to provide some value back to this program and encourage everybody to come. Hi, my name is Doug Haynes. I'm the Vice Provost for Academic Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and I just finished my second social media lunch and it was terrific. Like the first one earlier in the year, I learned a lot about creating an ecosystem that's so important to the office that I oversee, the Office of Inclusive Excellence. We want to reach out to more people, and what we've learned from Ryan's terrific training and education is that telling stories matter. It connects people together, it helps people find things that they have in common, and learn things that they didn't know. And so I'm looking forward to applying all the skills and tools that are made available today in hopes of expanding our connections to the entire campus, including students, faculty, and staff, and the wider community served by UC Irvine. Thanks. So if you do have the time to watch the full episode, I suggest you do. These social media lunches are to bring the UCI community together and share best practices about social media. My name is Ryan Fullen. I work with the Office of the Vice Provost. Well, before that, Samantha, you tried to get out of that? I didn't try. It was nonsensical. Okay. Um, Samantha, I'm from the office. Invisible woman? Is that, is that what you were trying to be there? <laughs> um, my favorite superhero is Deadpool. Okay, nice. And my favorite superhero is Vice Provost Doug Haynes. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the man, the myth, the legend. Yes. Uh, you're going to have your, your limelight in a second, but I just want to recognize you as a true superhero on campus. And as the host today, we're going to be really tying in what his office is doing, why it's important to you, and how you can develop that into a story marketing strategy for social media. Before we go any further, I want to clarify that I am not strategic communications, and this is not an official strategic communications communications workshop. They are for providing policy and procedure. Uh, they provide templates and amazing resources if you haven't checked them out online. And they provide the branding guidelines, which you all should be following, and I know that you do. If you have any questions about the policies and procedures or branding, Tanya Burketta is the person to go to. All of her contacts here, you all have access to this PowerPoint. If you don't have it, then we can get it to you. But as we move along here, we are the UCI Media communications team for the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. And if you have not heard about the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning, it's because it's relatively new. We, as the media unit, uh, we help with video, like Natalie in the back. Everybody say hi. Hi. And their amazing team, she does animation as well. We have the only certified drone footage uh, captain who's actually had to go through the whole pilot process to do it on campus. And we do do graphic design and website work, but for the people under our umbrella. So the Division of Undergraduate Education, Summer Session, and Teaching and Learning. Somebody asked, how do you check in? Well, you check in online by following us on our social media. And we are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Flickr. And today, my one ask for you is to, be, is to follow Michael Denon on his uh, YouTube page. So by following, that means subscribing. We've redone it. We're doing a lot of cool video. And we have to get to 100 subscribers before we can have a custom URL. 
So right now the URL is youtube.com forward slash and it'd be a lot easier if it were forward slash Michael Denon. So if that's the thing that you can do today for me, that would be great. And he's also on Twitter. Now we have a monthly newsletter that goes out. If you ever have an event that you want to promote or you want to shamelessly plug something, we'd love to hear about it. We're all about the shameless plugs because together, the more we shamelessly plug, the more people show up at our events. We have workshops like this, and we document each one with UCI Media. So there's a great repertoire online that has all of these. If you have a new student that comes on board, or a new employee, and they're in a social media capacity, it's a quick start for them to get going. And we're also de developing training videos that are three to five minute long for each of the major platforms, and we've finished all of Twitter. So how to sign up for Twitter, how to tweet, how to use a hashtag, the real basics, and they're highly produced, and my guest is Peter the Ant Eater, and he really knows what's going on. <laughs> Every Wednesday morning from 8 to 9, there's another resource on campus for you in the social media world. Uh, there is a show at KUCI called Get Notified, and the DJ's name is DJ Ginger MC. He's kind of a high energy guy in the morning, they'll get you going. Brings in influencers, brings in people that we talk about communication both online and offline. And speaking of shameless plugs, ladies and gentlemen, welcome Carlin, who is the shamelessly plugging the anti-cancer race. Yay! <laughs> Woo, come on down. Well, I hope you have all heard about the anti-cancer Wait a minute. Who has not heard of it? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh, oh. You're missing out, but it's not too late. That's the great news. So we have a new event, June 10th and 11th at Angel Studios. It's a free event. It's Now, Carla was on the radio show with a cancer survivor and a cancer doctor, and it was a really fun uh, experience to talk with both sides of that. And if you were not even participating in the race, just participating using the hashtags online the day or two of is really going to help create the awareness. It's a million dollar funding goal, and we can do it if we all sort of lend a helping hand. All right, questions about the OVPTL? Anybody? Perfect. Okay, what's for lunch today is a wonderful lunch provided by Doug Haynes, ordered by Samantha. So let's give them a round of applause for providing the environment here. And today especially, you know, our goal is to bring the community together and really connect you with real people, like offline communication, because that's where things start. The better you are communicating with people, the better that translates to online. And we're going to talk about storytelling as well as story marketing. And then I'm really excited because we're going to dig into real hero stories of people here on campus. And we're going to show you how this ties in to the new Hispanic Serving Institution and the Asian Pacific Islander long acronym, which I have a slide to guide me with, right? Longest acronym ever, but that means it's really cool. We're going to show you how this all wraps in because the stories here on campus are going to be very important for whatever social media strategy you have. So I'm really excited. Storytelling is one of my favorite things. So speaking of the host and my favorite superhero, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together again for Mr. Doug Haynes, who's going to talk about what he's doing here on campus. And if I might add, this is his testimonial from a social media lunch where the first question was, on a scale of 1 to 10, where are you? And he was a 0. <laughs> and at the end of it, he was a 4, 3. Now he's at a 3. He was at a 4. <laughs> All right, tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing. First, thank you. Uh, and I want to ask the question about superheroes. I have a full set of superheroes, the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> because my daughter and I used to watch them. And the father of the Powerpuff Girls is simply named as Professor. <laughs> that works. That works. Uh, but I want to talk briefly about the Office of Inclusive Excellence. Uh, because we, we focus on doing three things that matter to students, faculty, and staff. The first, we want to create a community where everyone expects equity. To create an environment where you are affirmed, where you can be successful as a student, as a staff, and a faculty member. The second 
is a support person. And one of the strengths of the campus is the fact that we draw on talented people from a broad cross-section of society. And third, we not only want to support diversity, we want to promote inclusion. Because by working together, we can have an even greater impact. And so we do that through a range of programming. But we have also been engaged uh, in elevating our commitment to diversity. So as uh, Brian mentioned, that the federal government designated UCI as a Hispanic serving institution. And this is a major milestone for the campus. It means that at least 25% of our undergraduates are Latino. Uh, it also means that 50% uh, of all of our students receive some type of financial aid. And I think, as most of you may know, the New York Times Access Index just designated the campus number one in providing affordable education to uh, low-income families. Can we get a big bueno for that? <laughs> massive, because it shows that UCI is truly fulfilling its obligation as a land-grant university and educating wonderful people who are highly motivated who want to go out in the world and change it and shape it. And so the second designation that Ryan alluded to was our ARPZ, Asian American, Native American, Pacific Island Serving Institution. And again, it's a way for the campus to really celebrate the diversity of the campus. And so we've been engaged in these activities over the past couple of years. And we believe it makes us stronger uh, as a campus. And is there a go back down. OK. Uh, okay. And then this is just you. This is just you talking and that. The rest is we're going to dive into. Oh, OK. And we'll bring up these topics along the way. But just this office is new. So if you haven't heard of it, uh, it's because it really was launched uh, in January 2016. And it really was an effort by Chancellor Gilman and Thomas Bernier to really focus the campus attention on bringing wonderful people to campus to be successful, whether as students, whether as faculty, whether as staff. And it's coordinate our efforts so that together we're stronger because we're working together. Um, uh, we've also launched uh, a number of new initiatives. Some of you have heard about our series entitled Bias, Prejudice, and Bigotry. Uh, lot, earlier this month, we had a, a CNN contributor known as Reza Azam, who talked about Islamophobia. Right? Uh, and it was really a way for the campus to communicate its values, that Islamophobia is the value of the campus. And we also wanted to invite the wider public uh, in the surrounding Orange County to really learn and participate in this really interesting and compelling lecture uh, that Dr. Oslin put on. Uh, we also rolled out uh, another lecture on this series in January on anti-Semitism with the uh, political science chair, Jeff Kopstein. And our effort in doing this is to create a conceptual vocabulary for more people to understand what bias is, what prejudice is, uh, and what bigotry is. And the goal is to allow us to be better stewards of creating a campus where everyone feels they belong, where they can do their best work, and most importantly, that they feel comfortable and able and willing to learn about someone else who's different from them. Because it's one thing to be diverse, it's another thing to actually know how to work with people, communicate with people, and learn with people who are different from each of us. And so those are some of the, the headlines I wanted to share. Who we are, we started in January 2016. We're focused on creating a community around equity, diversity, and inclusion. We do that through campus accountability, teaching and uh, training, responsive research, and strategic partnerships and initiatives. Uh, I, I'm a student of Samantha. Uh, she's helped uh, guide me through the social media space. And these are the uh, ways in which you can connect with us to continue the conversation. Great. All right. Good round of applause. So important, especially now, what's going on with this office. So, yes, question. Who has a question? I'm Doug. 
Um, I understand that 25 percent is considered the Hispanic serving institution. What are the requirements that earn the, the specific dial in the Native American? That's a great question. Uh, a minimum of 10 percent of students have to be uh, fall in the category of Native American, Native American, and, and or Pacific Islander. And so um, we were really sort of poised to achieve that pretty rapidly given our demography historically. Uh, and so in fall 2016, we applied and were designated for that purpose. One thing to keep in mind is that in addition to reaching the sort of uh, uh, compositional diversity, and if you need your Hispanic, half of all students must receive some type of financial aid. Because the purpose of these designations is to make the campus eligible for federal funding. It's really about broadening participation in higher education at UCI and across the country. All right, let's try something different. Don't clap. You know what to do. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Here we go. Now you're off. Good job. All right, now you can clap, because I know you want to. I know you want to. All right, the power of story. That's what we're going to be talking about. At the end of the day, social media is a platform, a set of platforms to tell stories. That's it. Really, what is social media at the end of the day? It's telling stories. And as humans, we're hardwired for stories. There was hundreds of thousands of years where communication through stories is the way things were passed down. It was only recently in our history that we started to write them down and then develop the storytelling process. So today we're going to talk about the power of story, how to tell stories, the hero's journey, and we're going to look at some heroes on campus. Now this is one of my favorite quotes about stories. People don't buy your product. You're not buying products, you're buying people's story. And if you think about this, at your unit, whether it's your grad division, undergrad division, your cross-cultural center, people are not buying your products. They're not buying your tutoring services, they're, pro they're buying the story that they can be involved with. They're buying into the story of being a better student or graduating or helping them with the challenge that they have with their story. So think about that. It's not your tangible products or services, it's the story that you communicate that's going to get people in the door. Summer session, what do you think about them as a whole unit? Are they really boring or are they fun? fun. They're super fun. Have you seen any of the stuff they have online? It's like they're dressing up as sons and like their whole atmosphere is fun. Like you're creating a fun story to do during summer. And that's a great angle if you're talking about spending your summer in school. What's UCI's story? You guys work here. What's the story with UCI? Bright past, brilliant future, right? They've got that drilled into your brains. <laughs> and what does it do? It talks about the past. It talks about the future. It has a lot of meat and potatoes within that one thing, but it's a story that they're telling to the world. And it's a story in just a couple words, and that's what makes it so powerful. How do you tell a good story? Do we have any professed storytellers in the room? Anyone likes telling stories? Okay, does anyone have kids? You kind of become a storyteller as a parent, right? Everything is in the, involved in a story. Well, there's a great TED Talk. This guy by name Andrew Stanton, and in this PowerPoint, if you click on the picture, it will lead you to it. Now, why is this in the form of a tweet? It's because I was at the social media marketing world where I created a tweet NATO and grabbed everything that I thought was of value. And because I'm at a situation where people are sharing their information and saying, take all the pictures and share all the information you want, there's no copyright issues with sharing my own tweets. And so that's just a little secret that's out there uh, for when you're putting together presentations and you always want to keep in mind privacy rights and laws of you know, copywriting. So if you are taking it and you're sharing it on a public platform, there's disclosures behind that. And so that's why I'm incorporating some that are actually tweets. And uh, this is what it says. It says, homework per Park Howell is to watch Andrew Stanton's at TED Talk, uh, hashtag story on, hashtag social media marketing world 17. And I'm going to give you the short version of his 17 to 18 minute talk. He created a lot of movies that you will recognize and realize, including Toy Story and including Finding Nemo. And he was very much avant-garde when it came to storytelling to break the traditional mold of the animated films. There are guidelines, not hard and fast rules. Guidelines, not hard and fast rules. So you can do all the research you want about best storytelling practices, but there's always an opportunity to innovate. There's never one specific way to tell a story. You can start with the end and the beginning. You can start with the middle and the beginning. You can start, uh, you can sing it, you can dance it, you can mime it. 
you just have to think of your audience. And so if you know what audience you're trying to approach, reverse engineer may be the best way to tell that story. But this should be empowering because there's more than one way to tell a story. The underlining theory of two plus two, he talks about this, and I talk about this a lot too. We are creatures that want to make connections. We like crossword puzzles. We like the edited versions of the movie. We don't like the 10,000 hours that they shot on location. We like puzzles and riddles. We like to finish people's sentences. We like puppies and babies because they can't complete sentences and you just want to complete the sentence for them, guessing what their emotions are. Oh, you're so, oh, what do you say? Yeah, oh, right? So the idea is if you're telling a story, don't say the number's four. <laughs> say it's two plus two and let the viewer, the person, make the connections. If you're being too obvious, if you're hitting somebody over the head like Thor with a big old hammer, it might be a little bit aggressive. So make your, the trick is to make your viewers work for it without them knowing that they're working for it. Make me care. You care, but make me care. And if you think about that, if you have somebody watch a video that you made or you have somebody write an article that you wrote, ask them, so why would you care about this? It's such an important, such a basic thing. And sometimes when we write, we forget about our audience. And we just think, we really, really care about this. Especially something like diversity or something like uh, a topic that can be polarized very quickly. Right? If I'm not an Asian American or I'm not Hispanic, pff, that doesn't have to do with me. But if the story tells that this creates more funding for the university, more resources for all students, and I'm not even a student, but I see that as a benefit to me. So the idea of why should I care, always ask yourself that and create a bit of wonder, right? Leave a little bit of details out. Let people imagine something, right? You don't have to give them everything. And if you don't give them everything and create wonder, they might just wander into your door. I just made that up. <laughs> okay, <laughs> now how does UCI use stories? Anyone? Popcorn? Yes? Placards on the buses, okay. Where they have like the, the, the water whisperer the or genie. the Gene Genie, yeah, stuff like that, okay. So using public transportation, what else? There's a lot of storytelling going on. Well, we did a video in our history last year where we had students, friends of our history who support our internship programs, staff and faculty, talk about why our history was a great major at UCI. Very cool. And how many people have yet to watch this? Right? So there's two components. There's telling stories, and then there's getting your stories out there. And on a campus where there's so much noise and everybody feels like their story is the most important, you have a real uphill battle for you. And that's where social media is a platform where you can hyper-target the people that want to listen to the stories, that care about those stories that you actually want. Do you really want bio -sci people watching your videos? Well, maybe, maybe not. There might be. A certain, certain subset of that that you might. So something to keep in mind. What about this story? <laughs> the story of the American dream. Is that not one of the most foundational stories that we all grew up with, that people flock to our country in droves for, that people either love us or hate us for? It's what this whole country is built on. Think about that for a minute. The story of the American dream. How can you loop that into your communication? There's wonderment in that. Why do you care about that? It's because I can be successful no matter what the obstacles. I can pick up myself up from the bootstraps. So there's a story. What about the, uh, as we talked about, this Hispanic serving? And what if you're not Hispanic? It's still such an important piece of the story. How about the first gen population on campus? Tying in first gen. There's tons of stories being about, out there about first gen. We had a whole <laughs> first gen awareness week that was put on by the, the UC as a system, right? Hashtag, I am first gen. Everybody's chirping in about it because they all have a piece of that story. There's the A-A-N-A-P-S-I-S-I, -S -S -I, right? Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander Serving Institution. That's a big part of our story. And as soon as you start to own that, you can now help to reach the people who are the population of campus. And what about the UCI stories? Who has not heard of the library's UCI stories yet? Raise your hand. OK, maybe still like 20%. So this is a really cool thing. For the 50th anniversary, 
UCI Media went and interviewed 50 different people from like the history of UCI and documented their own stories. And they're archiving it. But what a cool thing. I mean, that is storytelling in action. Look at this guy. He's finding out stories from having conversations with people. That's how you find stories. And then the Islamophobia that was being mentioned before. And if you notice, if you have a story in real life and it's live, but you're not able to document it and you're not able to share it, that story stops at the campfire. So this is another reason why storytelling is so integrated with social media. And it's not just about telling stories, it's about telling stories that will get people to wander into your door. Because that's what we want, right? We're sort of little businesses on campus that are all competing for the time and effort of students' time when they have a lot of other competing interests. And how about this, the Vietnamese American Oral History Project. It's a very cool project. Interviewing people that have survived through a time that had tons of strife, tons of challenges. And if we forget that, we're forgetting the roots, we're forgetting this culture, we're forgetting the tradition. Now, I'm going to come up here and read this because it's a small tweet. Everything we do is to connect with people. The same should be true online. Learn to express values you feel through stories. And the quote here is, nothing in social media makes sense except in the light of connection. I really like that. If you look at social media, it still is very confusing. Kevin was a guest on my show this morning. I threw him under the bus. I said, Kevin, today you're going to live tweet. And he said, OK. <laughs> He completely messed it up, like completely. He was tweeting the wrong stuff, replying to his own tweets, like I called him out on air, and it's okay because we erased it, right? We deleted it. You can delete tweets. But the idea here is that if you're looking at social media from the outside, and if you're anywhere less than a 10 on the 1 to 10 chart, it can look totally disconnected. It can look confusing. But at the end of the day, if you're using social media to connect people and stories, that's where it happens. That's the magic of it. So what is social media? It's storytelling. Why would you use it? To connect people with each other who want to share those same stories, who want to be inspired by stories, who want to learn from those stories. Because we're all sitting around a campfire, except it's just in a different form and doesn't put off as much heat. Right? Now, another great takeaway from the storytelling workshop was that a story has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But most of the time, people take the middle out because that's where the drama happens, or that's where things didn't go right, or that's where you didn't get the job, or that's where things failed miserably, or you got in trouble, or that was when you had the really rough time with your GPA. But let's talk about coffee for a second, right? Coffee starts off in the beginning uh, as these seeds, and then you grind them up. There's nothing more miserable than being ground in a coffee grinder. But that process of grinding it down is actually what allows the flavor to come out. So it becomes this beautiful coffee, and it's amazing, and it has effect on you, and it makes you happy, and cracks you out, and you're like, ah! But if you were just to say beans to coffee, you're missing part of the story. And whether it's with your business, whether it's with your center, whether it's dealing with students, if you're forgetting the middle, and you're, and you're not focusing on the drama and what doesn't go right, you're really not going to resonate with people. And that's why when you're telling stories, it's OK to share those struggles. Now, they can be positioned in a way where it doesn't make you look bad, but it gives you the credibility of actually being human and working through problems. And if you are into the storytelling thing, another book you should check out is called Storytelling Animal. And it's a, a scientist who really connected your brain's anatomy with storytelling. And so it's a fascinating look behind the scenes of how storytelling uh, is chemical. It gets involved with how humans interact with each other. So if you want some further reading on that, that should be good for you. That's the author. Part That's the author. And if you click on this link in the document, it'll go to Amazon. It's not an affiliate link. I'm not getting paid for it. <laughs> but you know how affiliate links work? If it was an affiliate link and I shared it with you and you clicked on it, you go to Amazon, you'd think that you were buying it yourself and I made like five cents or something. Okay. <laughs> Any questions about story? Now, I, I sort of blasted through that on purpose because I want to give sort of a high level, and I really want to dig into your brains that storytelling is social media, and social media is a place to tell stories. And you've got to make people care. You've got to know your audience. Know that it affects people in their brain, and people get excited about it. 
The best content online is stories that spark emotion, right? Not just regurgitating the highlights. If you ever watch uh, a highlight reel or if you ever watch something, it's usually, uh, you know, all the good stuff, but they always show the big bad plays, right? The stuff that went wrong, like, oh, that could have been it. Or my favorite sports highlights are the ones where <laughs> they didn't work out right. It's like that, ah. So don't be afraid to own what's not going right in part of your storytelling. Yes, Doug? So I have a question for how do you know your audience? How do you know your audience? It's a great question and probably one of the most pivotal questions when it comes to social media strategy. So let's, let's take an example here. For your office, okay, and before you answer, I'm going to tell you you're not allowed to say the E word or the A word, okay? I know you're a calm guy, but not the E word or the A word. Everyone or anyone, okay? <laughs> so whenever I ask people what's your market, most all of them will say everybody. You talk to an entrepreneur who's got a product, they're like, this is for everybody. But as soon as you're for everybody, nobody wants to hang out with you. As soon as you be like, ah, oh, this probably isn't for you, why, why, what, what? Right? It's the great takeaway. So for your office, who would be a target market on campus? You want to communicate your core values across campus. Well, I can't use those two words. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess part of it are some of our funded programs, that's Okay. So oh, right there, I heard faculty who you've given money to. Yeah. That's part of your target audience. Do you see how, more power, how much more powerful that is than all faculty? Yeah. If you send a Zop mail to all faculty, you know how many people are going to open it? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> if you send personal emails to the 100 faculty that it's coming from you and it says, I want to talk with you, that's a target, right? Yeah. The difference between a target market and a market potential is huge. Right? The target market are the early adopters, the people that want to read your stuff, the people that are the first ones to buy that iPhone, and then everybody else sees that they're talking about it or it comes up in conversation, then they start to get interested. And then you sort of have the laggards at the end. It's, it's, a, it's a product adoption curve, but it's a product, uh, it's a content consumption curve. Just made that one up too. So. All right? So your target audience would be professors and faculty who you funded, right? What about students? What subsets of students? Well, I mean, um... now, now, granted, our goal is to get to all students, right? But right now, are you more concerned about undergrads or graduate students? Well, we have more uh, contact with graduate students. Okay. That was the question. Who would you, who would you like to? What is, what is more of a target market? Well, I, 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 yeah, I think undergraduates. Undergraduates, uh, one of the challenges is to uh, to figure out how to connect with them. Right. So, for, so, so that's a great example. Stop for a minute, okay? And if you're, if you're thinking, how do I connect with them? Where, tell me, where are undergraduate students? Where are they? They're yelling on Ring Road. They're in Starbucks, right? They're online. What platforms are they on? Are they on this? Are they on that? And that's where sometimes you have to go out there and ask them. I always tell people that you'll find a lot more in offline conversations than you will online. When you have a student that walks in, how'd you find us? What's going on? Where are you hanging out? Where is this community? And for you, sir, I think that some of the organizations that are maybe um, geared towards more of a diverse outreach on campus that have a voice that want to share, those are great ambassadors for you. Because you, in a suit, talking to a student in Ugg boots, maybe there's a bit of disconnect. Right? They respect you, it's not like they're going to ignore you, but are they really getting that message? So maybe it's an ambassador concept because peers talk with peers. It's just something to think about. Yeah. Yes? Well, another, another target audience for you are, like me, undergraduate coordinators. So yes. I manage the social media for our history, and we have Twitter and two Facebook pages, our department and our, our history undergraduate association. And I, like, I posted a bunch of those. Yeah, I was going to say, are you always looking for content? I'm always looking for content, and I, and I take it, and, I, and also we do a weekly, I do a weekly email blast, and so I put pieces of that, I get links to yep. some, you know, and there's been a bunch of stuff that came out of your office that's been phenomenal, and I just send it right through to the yeah. students, and I know that they're reading it because I get feedback from them, and then, you know, I have my little charts, you know, about how many 
So, so there's a connection, right? That's a smart way to do it. Another suggestion here. Mm -hmm. here's, here's another question, all right? And I want you all to vote. You're going to vote for freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, or graduate student. You only get one vote. Doug, I want you to watch. You're in a good spot, okay? Who do you think is the most important to get in front of if you could only choose one? Ready? I want you to vote only once. Freshmen, raise your hand. Sophomores, raise your hand. Juniors, raise your hand. Seniors, raise your hand. Graduates, raise your hand. Do you see what happened there, Doug? If you don't get them at a freshman, you don't get them at all. Why not invest your time into the people that you have a fresh opportunity to? That can mean working with the, the hall coordinators, the RAs, getting boots on the ground there. Did you see that, that scale that goes down? And if you invest your time into seniors right now, how many years do you have with them? And if you're communicating with the graduate students, how active are they in anything other than their studies, right? They're like, don't talk to me, I'm studying, which is a good thing. So just something to think about. So your target market after this little 10 minute powwow is freshmen, specifically even maybe coordinators that have influence to larger spots that are also looking for content. How many people here would like to have somebody else write all of their content, <laughs> right? So that's something to think about, but great question. And certain stories resonate with certain people. Okay? Yes. So some really quick kind of um, fun fact to listen to a plan for, for me. So I was talking to a graduate student about, um, he's also a friend of mine, about how she was, uh, if she was reading a grad mail or different things we were sending out because we were just getting such low, low responses from people. And I found out, she's like, oh, a few years ago I set up a, an algorithm that filters through my mail and sends all of your stuff to Sam whenever I see it. So she <laughs> just sort of, that explains, you know, this might not be the best way to reach these graduate students. They get so much email every It's a great day. point. Grad students are smart. If, if, if you're flagging an impersonal email that comes from a Zot mail that you don't see or have interest in, it doesn't, they don't care. Why does it care? Why do I care about that, right? You're shoving it down their throat. They'll use an algorithm or just in Google Mailbox and identify and filter it straight into the trash. In fact, Google does that for you now. There's spam that hits that you don't even know. And that's what's happening in a lot of your email unless you have this connection with people. Yes. Kids. Yes. And Yep. And so maturity, and they really appreciate being here on a level that most freshmen know. Yep. So I think that's a really important. To yeah. So about. Kevin Huey at the Student Transfer Center and the Student Success Center that it now is, right? Some of these allegiances within the Division of Undergraduate Education, UU for example, is great because people go there for support and counseling, right? The Entrepreneurship Center tap into people who are doing great things that might fit into these categories to highlight. The Study Abroad Center, rat ratcheting on to students and wanting to share their stories when they come back from overseas. So you have these sort of champions and these 25 different units in the Division of Undergraduate Education that you can tap into. And uh, you know, from a strategic communication standpoint, I've seen you do these great presentations in front of everyone, but remember, that's just one blip on a whole bunch of stuff that they're dealing with, and do they care about it? So you've got to make people care, or you've got to find the people that already care. And it's a lot easier to find the people that care than get people to care about something they don't care about. Hashtag care. Okay? <laughs> Great question. Okay, are we ready for the story cycle? Yes! Storytelling has been saving people from saber-toothed tigers since the beginning of time. Okay? And today, compelling stories are helping people spark action, become inspired. And when we sat down, Doug, with you and Samantha, we talked about how do we make people care about Hispanic serving schools? How do we make people care about Asian Pacific and the long acronym serving schools? And it's through stories. And it's specifically the, the hero's journey. 
So this is a tweet. I just want you to look at the concept, OK? There's 10 dots, and that's what we're going to go through. The story cycle, apply it to your company brand content, apply it to your life. Make your customers part of the story. Make your customer, make your students part of the story. So, does anybody recognize this guy? It's hard to see. It's not Walt Disney. There we go. Give him a round of applause, Joseph Campbell. <laughs> Sue, you missed that one. Like he's a literary journalist. He, like he's a lit guy. Comparative. Okay, okay, unfair. And he, well, you both have glasses, so it's you know. But he's okay. <laughs> So what he did, he was fascinated with storytelling and religion, and he went back in time and he created the concept of what's known now as a monomyth. And it is the hero's journey. And this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, if you're into storytelling, you're heroes at all, this is a compilation of comparative literature from myths from millions of years ago, might not be millions, all the way to today, trying to find the similarities. And what he found is that each of these heroes have a very similar story. There is a very specific outline and arc that they go through. Each and every one of the heroes that you talked about, they've all gone through this story, and that's why you love them so much. So it's not that there's, they have to be superheroes. They can be real people, and we all go through this. So what we, there, there's a cool little video. Did anybody check out this video? I don't okay, know. so we're going to watch this. I think it's a valuable couple minutes. I might cut it off. But we're going to learn the story of heroes on campus from a student, a graduate, and a faculty what along do Harry the same Potter, line. Katniss Everdeen, and Frodo all have in common with the heroes of ancient myths. What if I told you they are all variants of the same hero? Do you believe that? Joseph Campbell did. He studied myths from all over the world and published a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, retelling dozens of stories and explaining how each represents the monomyth or hero's journey. So what is the hero's journey? Think of it as a cycle. The journey begins and ends in the hero's ordinary world, but the quest passes through an unfamiliar, special world. Along the way, there are some key events. Think about your favorite book or movie. Does it follow this pattern? Status quo, that's where we start. One o'clock, call to adventure. The hero receives a mysterious message, an invitation, a challenge. Two o'clock, assistance. The hero needs some help, probably from someone older, wiser. Three o'clock, departure. The hero crosses the threshold from his normal, safe home and enters the special world and adventure. We're not in Kansas anymore. Four o'clock, trials. Being a hero is hard work. Our hero solves a riddle, slays a monster, escapes from a trap. Five o'clock, approach. It's time to face the biggest ordeal, the hero's worst fear. Six o'clock, crisis. This is the hero's darkest hour. He faces death and possibly even dies, only to be reborn. Seven o'clock, treasure. As a result, the hero claims some treasure, special recognition, or power. Eight o'clock, result. This can vary between stories. Do the monsters bow down before the hero, or do they chase him as he flees from the special world? Nine o'clock, return. After all that adventure, the hero returns to his ordinary world. 10 o'clock, new life. This quest has changed the hero. He has outgrown his old life. 11 o'clock, resolution. All the tangled plot lines get straightened out. 12 o'clock, status quo, but upgraded to a new level. Nothing is quite the same once you're a hero. Many popular books and movies follow this ancient formula pretty closely. But let's see how well The Hunger Games fits the hero's journey tempo. Cool, right? When you start to think about things in this actual journey that heroes take, like the drama that I'm having right now of losing my clicker, but it's over here. See, now I feel like I've overcome. The food stole, the food monster. <clears throat> Hard to do this. Let's see, we need to get to the next slide. So there's a 10-step guide, and this is a really interesting exercise for you to do personally and for you to understand how this looks on campus. And this is a great piece of meat 
for, or, vege, or vegetarian meat or meat substitute, okay? For a lot of social media content that you can do. You can create whole marketing strategies around this. And if you look at some of the stories that have been used, a lot of it, you'll find those components, right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna discover your own narrative or share a narrative in these 10 steps and then you can channel your own inner superhero. So let's meet some heroes at UCI. Now I was a hockey goaltender for 15 years. I look just like that, but with more pads. I think Peter is a hero, but I didn't get to interview him because he's not very talkative. So, whoa, clicker's going crazy. You sneezed and that made it happen, right? If somebody sneezes in a room, be careful about your clicker. I want you guys to own your own story. And I have some post-it notes here. And as an exercise, a group exercise, maybe once we run through this, you are gonna figure out where you fit in these people's stories. And that's what's important. You'll recognize and you'll see these stories. A student that goes through the hero's journey. A graduate student as they take their way onto the world. A faculty member. A staff member. Everybody here, we have our own journey. But today, the exercise in groups is going to figure out where you, individually, you as a person, and where your department, or where your unit, or your Toastmasters, or your group, or your, your little click on campus, where you are in the story. So think about that as we go along. And I'm gonna encourage you, if you have a business card, that's where I want you to put it. And I want you to write the name of your, of your department or something, and I want you to put it there. And in the groups, I'm gonna challenge you to think of other places on campus that aren't represented here that support these various things. And then we're gonna give uh, Professor Haynes a very cool set of support group that you can use and specifically target to get your message out. Not because they want to, it's because they care because they are part of the story. Maybe they're a monster too, so I don't know. Okay, so I got a student, a, grad, a graduate, and a faculty member to participate. So our student is Angie. Angie, give her a round of applause. Yay. It's a real person. Okay. And then, what, now what graduating class are you? I might have totally missed this. Is it 19? Or is it next year? I forget. Next year, okay. So pretend that the 19 is an 18. Just like pretend on the email I sent, the social media lunch was a lunch. <laughs> now, I don't know if you do, but the last little scan, I click on the send button, hold it down, I'm like, do this last little scan, and then I just released, and as I released and it was going, I saw the lunch, I was like, ah, oh. ah. Oh. <laughs> struggles, technology struggles, right? That's part of the monsters. And then uh, Erica Kane, she's class of 2017, just graduated. Quantitative Economics, minor in Asian American Studies. And a faculty, Tanya Bradford, uh, really fun lady to talk to, and I'm gonna share her story with you. And by the end of hearing these stories, you're gonna get to know these people. And then now you're gonna know why you should care about them. And this little exercise here, multiply it by hundreds of thousands of users online, and you can start to build communities that will start to care about what you wanna talk about. All right, so the slides are gonna be the backstory, and then we're gonna share the specific examples. So the backstory is where in the world have you been? Has everybody had a life before you? Yes. So here's the backstory. And I wanted to stick them up somewhere. Maybe we can actually, this, I don't think that the duct tape will take this paved off. I think it's, it's just, this is, this is good. Okay, so we're gonna do this. Here's the backstory. Okay, it's not, it's, it's not aggressive duct tape. And if it comes off, I will repaint it. I do paint, okay? So here's the backstory. And, and I, these are post-it notes that kind of give examples so that, Doug, you have a fresh reminder. But when everybody comes and puts their post-it notes, it'll be a nice little folder and you can see how many people are involved in the backstory. Angie grew up in Anaheim. She lives in Irvine. She didn't know where she was going to go to college. That's something that a lot of people resonate with. They don't know where they're going to go and they end up here, right? Um, <clears throat> our grad student, she grew up in San Gabriel. All of her friends went to UCI, so that's why she went to UCI. That's it. There's no other decision, right? So remember, some people are coming here without knowing, some people are coming here just cause. And uh, our, our faculty, she was actually in the financial services for 17 years. And the favorite, the most enjoyable parts about her financial career is when she got to talk to people and educate people. She lived all over the world and there was just something that didn't, like she was in this financial world but she really enjoyed teaching. And that's where she came before. So the second step is that you are a hero and this is you, right? This is everybody in the room. This is the actual hero. And 
it's important to know who that person is, right? Popeye's got big forearms. Everybody knows that Thor's got a hammer. So, and it's okay to be vulnerable, it's okay to be an underdog, things like that. So Angie, she, let's see, uh, she's a psychology major, she enjoys social media, hanging out with close friends, uh, priorities are school and family. That's who she is as a superhero. Uh, our grad student, she's an assertive person, and she said, I'm not that typical quiet Asian. I've got a voice, and I talk about stuff that's important to me. It's like, whoo, I can see this, right? And the faculty, she's got a soft heart for helping people get from A to Z that don't know how to get there. Right? So you just know a little bit more about them. Now, what are the stakes? The stakes of going to college are huge, right? Um, you want to make your family proud and give back to them, right? You, this is a huge commitment, a huge investment. Um, our graduate student, she only started to get serious about school her junior year. Right? Think about that. She was MIA for the first two. And if you think about that, there's a lot of students, as you mentioned, with freshmen, they're just kids. They're just really not here. So you've got to understand that. And the faculty, uh, she, her father was actually part of uh, in the Deep South with bus boycotting, and her whole family was, was geared around how do we help lift everybody up. And like her roots are in sort of dealing with that family struggle of a real struggle that a lot of American families have dealt with. And she is so excited to be at UCI, specifically because she feels that what she's doing here is helping what her father was trying to do however many years ago. So it's interesting, you get to know people's history. Disruption. This is where it starts to get exciting, right? There's this inc uh, inciting incident, the thing that actually creates the change. And if you ask people this, sometimes they really know exactly. So for, for Angie, uh, the financial issues really propelled her to take college seriously right from the get-go, right? So that's a difference between somebody who just comes here and junior year wakes up versus like the inciting incident is like, my parents are going out of the line here and I want to do this. And once you start to find students' intention, then you know what's important to them, right? Then uh, the, the student serving institution that gets more money that my parents have to pay less is in line with my goals. So again, ways to communicate. Uh, the grad student we talked to, she was very honest and she said, when I came here, I was super self-centered. It's just about getting through the courses and getting done. And then she met a friend, she went to a Christian fellowship, and it really changed her life, and she thought, well, it's really not about me, it's about serving people. So even on campus, you have people that have these inciting incidents. And when you understand what those are, with 20,000 people, there's a chance that there's a lot of common ground. Right? An inciting incident for somebody whose parents have cancer, whose mom died from cancer, that will change their life. There's an entrepreneur who's a PhD student, and her grandma had mobility issues. That is why she went to college, to fix that problem. She's invented a new type of wheelchair. She just won a business plan competition uh, last year in both Beale and Butterworth, and then she just won the Aging 2.0 competition, going to the next level, all because she was so close with her grandma and couldn't stand to see her grandma being immobile. And so for somebody who's anti-cancer, find people that that's really their passion, and those are the people that it's important. Now, the faculty member, this was so crazy, because she said, I was working for 17 years, I took a sabbatical, because I could, and I went and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And she said, I never thought about climbing a mountain before, and I thought about a career change, and as I climbed up this summit, I realized on the top of the summit, if I can climb this mountain, I can do anything. And when she went home, she said, you know what? I'm gonna leave the financial industry, I'm gonna go get a PhD, and I'm gonna find somewhere where I can make a difference. I got the goosebumps on. I'm like, really? Could you not say anything more in line with what I want? <laughs> but it's crazy, right? Like, if you didn't know or ask her what that inciting incident was, I would have never known. She would have never told you she went and climbed a mountain after 17 years in the financial industry. And these are the type of things that resonate with people. This is the content. This is the meat and potatoes. This is what makes your posts um, something that people care about. Now the antagonists, these are the monsters, right? I've drawn one, there's lots of these on campus. And the monsters come in many forms, <laughs> right? They can be a person, place, or thing, and there can be multiple, right? Angie is her worst enemy. She is the monster chasing after herself, as a lot of us are. Our grad student had low confidence because her GPA was so low. She was so focused on the fact that like, her GPA was a reflection of herself. And so just a simple question of, identifying if a student is doing well in school 
That will affect everything. See that? The monster's running. <laughs> Never stops. Clicker's still here. It's okay. And uh, for the faculty, uh, she had to move into town. She was fearful of selling her house, of living and eating in California, because there's a word on the street, it's hard to do both, right? <laughs> she was worried about um, being in a new town. But what she ended up finding later on in the story is that she was able to overcome that. But these are huge hurdles that she ended up sort of having to fight against. Mentor, right? Who is your Yoda? Now, this can come in a few different forms. What do you guys think? Who are some mentors on campus? Anyone? Who's a mentor? Yes? Well, give me an example of a mentor on campus. Maybe I didn't hear you. Who is Yoda on campus? Identify some Yodas. You are. You are Yoda. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes? In Tennis Masters, it's senior members of my club. Yeah, OK. Yes? Um, and we have an uh, undergraduate association and we really focus on the leadership, mentoring the other students, and kind of keeping that going so everyone gets the experience of having a mentee and, and having a mentor. Right. What about the Writing Center? Do you guys just grade papers, or do you just stuff, or does it, do you develop a relationship with people? <laughs> right? Sue is, like, Sue is like the mother hen over there. It's like, come to me with writing children, and let's like form this little community, and write, and talk, elevated talk, and support systems. Clubs on campus. Student organizations. If you start to think of clubs and student organizations as mentors in the, in the path or the journey of students, guess what? Go to the Pacific Asian Islander Club. Those guys are extracurricularly trying to find things to do, right? So tap into those mentors. Some examples. Angie's mother is bigger and biggest mentor. When was the last time you talked with a student and actually asked about how their family's doing, right? That's a legacy that'll come through. So understanding that is, is huge. The grad student said she had different mentors at different times. And as soon as she got involved with this Asian Pacific Islander club, she now had a chance to serve other people. And that was really important to her. And the faculty, she was talking uh, about a gentleman named Alad Benkatash. He was here before the Mirage Business School. And here's the ironic thing, is that she used and referenced him throughout her dissertation. She ran into him at a conference and was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to meet you. Within the conversation, he said, you ever thought about moving to California? And that was the start of how she found out to come to UCI. And he has been there as a guiding light, as a rock, through her entire year here. And she wouldn't be able to do what she's doing without him. So finding those key mentors and identifying them, right? Even if you're asking people, think about from a story perspective, asking people who has been helpful to mentoring them and do a story on that person. How great are they going to feel about that? It would be a great profile. OK, uh, let's see, journey. Let's get the journey going on. Walking on a tight rope. And as you see, they alternate between guy and girl. Okay, this is, this is very equal here. We are all in this journey. Or guy, girl, LGBT, whatever it is. It's very inclusive here. So the journey, right? What are your trials and errors? Right when you're on the cusp of victory and you think everything's going great, you end up having to take bio 222 or whatever it is, <laughs> right? The one class that just knocks everybody out of there. And there are various monsters on campus. So what are the different types of monsters? We talked about mentors. What are the monsters? Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy. <laughs> yes. Size. How big, place. How big the place is, right? It's intimidating. Roots walking through Aldrich Park. OK? <laughs> What else? What are Tests, homework, girls, boys, beer, right? All these things are challenges, but they're real. And as soon as you identify them as part of these stories, you can start to understand the hero a little bit better. So let's listen to some trials here. Um, Self-doubt is a huge one that holds people back. And you can be part of that story by helping to build them up. For a grad student, it was her LSAT. Straight up, she's like, LSAT, done. Worst summer of my life. Okay? And if you know somebody's going through that, how are the resources and how can you help get people through that? 
And for the faculty, this is interesting. She said, look, in a marketing class, I've been spending the last 17 years hoarding information to share, so I have really strong content. I have to put 20 weeks of content into 10 weeks. But what she does is she looks at students, and undergrads specifically, not as a student, but as a whole person. And that means that she, her struggle, her monster is that she has to pull out this lesson plan and incorporate how to do a good interview, or touch on public speaking, or talk about some of the things, life balance that you have to do, incorporate it in. She gave me an example. She said, it's a 10 year anniversary of the iPhone. And she has collected and documented and recorded and stored just about every single piece of marketing in the last 10 years that has to do with the iPhone. She's so excited about it. But the monster is she doesn't have time for it because that's not as important as doing mock interviews for marketing companies so that it's practical to help these students for her goal, for her vision, her victory, which is to help them know how to succeed. So professors thinking about their struggle, their monsters is that they are struggling between education and life skills. If you have a chance to help them with those life skills, you help out the professor. Eight, victory. What does success look like? What are some examples as I walk over here? What is, what is, what is victory on campus? For you guys here, as staff, faculty, whatever. What's a win? Over 100,000 applications for undergraduate programs. There you go. That's a victory for the school, right? You guys are working here. You're dedicating your time and energy. Why? Is it just the money? <laughs> St helping students to achieve their dreams. That's what something looks like. What else? Collaboration with other units. Okay. Collaboration with other units. But for you, for you, for your hero, like why, why are you, I know it's your job, but what is a victory for you? Is raising a million dollars for this a victory for you because it's there? Is that your final answer? <laughs> so, so yeah, and, and before this, were you into the cancer concept and helping support? Yeah. Okay, so interesting example. You can get a job and it can become a passionate career, right? We didn't go out of college going, I'm going to run a campaign to help solve cancer, but the skill set that you had, the struggles that you went through, the tests that you took, all this drama that you went through led you on your path to here. Come on, what are some other personal goals? Like, what does victory look like for you guys? Because if you don't know where victory is, you're not going to get there. Yes? You're, right. you're, te you're teaching the teachers, you're giving them the tools, right? For me, it's professional development. Like, I feel like I'm still learning. And by doing this, I'm learning, and I'm fumbling, and I'm stumbling, and I'm working through it, and it's helping me as a person, right? I'm passionate about social media and UCI, but I'm really passionate about helping people become better communicators. Because communication, for me, is a skeleton key. You get anything you want if you can communicate it better. And maybe if you go like this, it might work better than this. So I'm practicing and testing, but that's a challenge for you, is, what is a victory for you? And if you can combine what's a victory for you with what your job duty is, you will excel. People will be like, you are smashing it and you're having so much fun. What is going on? What's wrong? <laughs> so victory from the student perspective. Um, basically feeling happiness and peace. What a cool like peace of mind and happiness. What a great victory goal. Uh, for the grad student, this was powerful when she was talking. She almost came up with it on the moment. Like she realized, she should have said, my victory is realizing that my career is not me. My job title is not me. I came into school arrogant. I want to be in finance because I want to make money because that's what success means. So that's what my parents said. But at the end of the day, I realize it's about serving other people. And even if I don't become a lawyer, a lawyer is just a way to serve people and I can still be happy with it. It's a really empower, empowering concept. And for the faculty, I love this. It's not the big stuff. It's the small stuff. It's the daily victories. It's something that when she sees a student fail in midterm and the next time they don't fail, she's like, yes, victory. 
And those are the victories that you can highlight. Those are the victories that are part of the stories, and that's the fun stuff to share. All right, second to last one, the moral of the story. Right? What is the moral? It's the universal truth that you learn at the end of the day. Right? For one, it was to serve others. For the professor, it was never to give up. And even if she doesn't become a lawyer, she still can serve people. So thinking about that, right? And then 10, the ritual. What is the next episode? Return of the what? Right? The uh, Indiana Jones and the blank. What's going to be your next episode? Because this journey happens all the time. It happened in middle school. It happened in high school. It's going to happen in college. It's going to happen again. In your job here, it's going to continue to repeat. So the ritual, the ritual, stairs. Uh, for the student, Angie wakes up earlier. She studies more. She works out more. And she watches what she eats in order to have a more fulfilled life. As a freshman, you don't know that. But as failing tests and waking up late and not feeling good, those are the things that you overcome to do that. For the grad student, it was that her reflection on sort of missing the boat for her undergrad has changed her whole perspective for grad school. She can take every class and think, why is this important to me? And how can I use this to serve people? What a powerful concept. And for the faculty, uh, one of the things that she does is every morning, she takes a walk for 30 minutes. And she clears her head and she's mindful about what has happened the last day. And that's a help guidance for her to reaffirm that what she's doing is creating positive change. And on the phone with her, I said, stop it. Do you know what you're doing every morning? She said, what? I said, you're climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Every morning, you go out there and you find yourself in nature and peace. And that's what got you excited about this in the first place. What a cool concept. And this is the example that, you know, this big challenge, right? This, this inciting incident, once you recognize it, it might be with you all the time. And if you can find the student's inciting incident, you can play into that. Then you can continually deliver information that is valuable to them. And here's a challenge for you. What's your story? Because Doug in his office would love to hear how you are, what, what your journey is. And so here's a Google form which is exactly these 10 things. And it just prompts you with these exact same questions. And it would be so fascinating for him to sit there and go, wow, look at this person's journey. You don't have to put your name. It would be nice if you put faculty, staff, or student. And if you want to encourage other people in your office to do this as well, it's such a great realization tool. And then once you start to think his stories, you'll be like, hey, that's part of the moral. Or, hey, that's part of, that's the mentor. And so this leads us to our group activity, uh, which is once you share the stories, you can actually change the world. And it's only when the story gets shared. So the group activity is to get into groups, right? You can maybe flip so that you're talking with the people next so it's not too chaotic. And I'm going to come around with post-it notes. And I want you to use your business card. We got some duct tape. That's cool. But I want you to write down your unit or anything else on campus that you can think of that supports within these. And I want you to physically go up there and stick them on there. And these are conveniently double as folders. So stack them up. And then, Doug, you're going to have a whole bunch of folders. And all the people that are stuck on here are people that care because they're involved in that part of the story. Social media at the end of the day is storytelling. Try it again. Social media is storytelling. And it's a platform to tell stories. And you're all? Story yeah, that was good. You guys are good. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. You can find the OVPTL at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or at ovptl.uci.edu. This is Ryan Foland. I am signing out. <laughs>